This is the Mike Stern book, Altered Scale Soloing for Jazz Guitar. Master Powerful Altered Scale Soloing with Mike Stern. This is a great book for many reasons. Some of you might feel like you have to improve your altered scale soloing. So the altered scales is something we need to pay extra attention to when we're learning to jazz improvisation. And what he means by that, there are four scales he covers in this book, the altered, the actual altered scale, but also some other scales. The scales that you play over a dominant chord that has kind of a sharp five or a flat five or a sharp nine, flat nine. So the, the mixolydian scale doesn't work. You need some kind of altered scale. So the book kind of covers those scales, tons of licks. There's over 140 audio examples. In the beginning there of the video, I was playing a little bit of one of the examples from the book. It's much more. I only played like two courses out of, I don't know, six or something. It's also a good book if you want to kind of get inside the head of Mike Stern. And uh, there are certain things that he does, right? Like Mike Stern-isms, some bebop language mixed with blues and Michael Brecherisms and stuff like that. And if you are like me, a lick collector, this is a book that you need because it's tons of licks. So let's get right into it, shall we? So the first scale is the actual altered scale. So let's just play it. Let's play it on one string. He suggests that you just play it on one string. It's a great idea. There are different ways you can think of this scale. You can think of it as an A flat jazz minor or melodic minor. starting on the seventh degree, starting on G. Because it's the seventh mode of A flat melodic minor, but you should be able to think of it from it, the roots. You, it's a flat two, a flat three, a flat four, which is also a major third, but in theory, it's a flat four. Flat five, flat six, flat seven, so everything except the tonic is flat. But it's easier to think of that C flat as a, as a B natural. So it's G, A flat, B flat, B natural, D flat, E flat, F, G. That's how I think of that scale. Right off the bat, he puts the scale to use. So you, let's say you have a two, five, one in C major. We put the scale to use over the G7, right? So here's a lick. Stern. So it's a typical 251 lick, and there's so many. That was example 1E. So there's a whole bunch of those. So I'm not just, I'm not gonna give them to you because they're in the book, right? It's copyright, but I'll just give you a taste. That's the audio that comes with the book and with Mike Stern playing. So you're playing along with Mike Stern, which is kind of cool. So 
this is me playing along with the next example. So now he starts to kind of give you different exercises with the scale. First, he just plays the scale. It's kind of nice with the, you know, Mike Stern trademark sound with his chorus and everything. So here's the thing though, a lot of people, they tell you when you learn this scale, just go up a half step and think melodic minor, which is true and you should be able to do that. But you need to be able to hear it from the root. So you need to be able to sing it, basically. I once had a student online who asked me if I could give him the best exercise. So he didn't want to waste time with unnecessary redundant exercises. He was like, just give me the only thing I need to know to become good at this jazz improvisation stuff, which is, he said it kind of with humor, but it doesn't really work like that. But one thing I would say, if I were to try to answer that question, make sure that when you learn these scales that you can kind of hear them, right? So, cause it, if it's just a finger pattern, it's not gonna come out in your playing. And even if it is, it's gonna sound mechanical. It's gonna sound like you're just moving your fingers. Cause when you're improvising, you want your mind to die, decide what you're playing, not just run your fingers. You're gonna sound like one of those mindless, you know, just like running their fingers in shapes. That doesn't mean that you ne don't need to practice the scales. You need to learn the positions. So it's a combination of a visual thing where you see the scale shapes on the fretboard and mentally. And it's also a, a mental intellectual exercise where you know the notes and the theory at some level are aware of it when you're playing. But most of all, it's an ear training, hearing it, in my opinion, and instinct. So that, that instinct takes over. So you want to make sure that you can sing it. So then he goes into thirds. So you might want to play some kind of pedal. And here again, try to sing it. Right? But now I could do that because it was fresh in my memory. So I want to try somewhere else. Let's go to E flat or something. And here is the thing. If I played just a note like that, if I can hear that altered sound in my head now, even without playing the chord, and then sing. Make sure that, yeah, that was right. That's the tricky note there. That wasn't really clean. So for me to kind of make sense of the key signatures there, I'm thinking it's easier to think E melodic minor. I don't even know what the actual theory would be like double flats and stuff. If I were to play, spell out the scale correctly from a theory point of view, but there's the theory side of things. And then there's the practical side of things. So sometimes I think of the scale a half step up. And if I play D altered, for example, then I would think from D, so D, E flat, F, F sharp, a flat, B flat, C. So I'm thinking everything from some kind of D scale, but I'm playing E flat altered. I'm thinking E minor. That's how I kind of sorted out that over the years. So be able to kind of play in every 
altered key. So you want to spend time with all the keys, all the altered scales, but not all at once. So may, if you're new to that stuff, maybe do one a week or something to really get to know the scale. Cause it's, this is much harder than just playing in major modes, right? There's more key signatures. Then you do the same exercise with other intervals. Let's go back to G and do fourths. So the first interval is going to be in the major third, right? Because remember, it's a flat four. That's why it's important to think of it as a flat four. It's not a major third in theory. It's a, sometimes you need to be aware of that. So the first interval is going to be a third. Also play the chord. G B A flat D flat B flat E flat B F D flat G. So it's not about singing with a beautiful voice. My voice is terrible, but you want to pay attention to that your uh, which notes are harder to find because those are the notes that make you kind of not feel the scale properly if you know what i mean then he does this with all the other intervals as well he does it with fifths sounds like this <laughs> see that Mike Stern has practiced this stuff you should too and of course it's only gonna give you one key here so you need to do this in every key every alter scale he even goes further into sixths and sevenths which if you're gonna sing that it's gonna be a real challenge right then there's some more licks here's a really nice lick I'm gonna steal this lick and put it to use over a standard so at the end of this video I'm gonna take one lick from each chapter and put it to use over what is this thing called love. So here's a lick based on those kind of fourths. So again, we're playing in two five in C major. So here we're kind of ignoring the two chord and just treating the whole two first two bars as G altered, which is a technique that's very common. Just harmonic generalization. playing the whole lick I'm just using the alter scale stuff so we're thinking about those two bars the first two bars as their G alter so he's playing one pattern and then a different pattern so that's a good idea to break up the pattern when you're improvising because if you're playing too much of the same pattern it sounds like you're practicing it's too predictable even though sometimes you can do that but if you mix it up then it sounds like you're improvising because you are improvising more than just playing a predictable pattern. So you could also play all these things one up and one down. Uh, let's say I want to play thirds up and down. Sounds like this. Uh, 
again, it's important that you don't shift what happens in the beginning for, to some people is that we start to hearing it as A flat melodic minor. But you need to hear it with, in relation to the actual root. So maybe use a pedal. Then he breaks it up as triads, diatonic triads. So Same thing there, make sure you hear it in relation to, to G because it's easy to start hearing it as A flat minor. And then of course, uh, four part chords or arpeggios. So I'm playing the chords as a harmonized scale. Here's another one I'm gonna steal, a 2-5-1 lick. So here I'm not so sure that it's actually is altered. That's not altered, right? That's a regular five. So a lot of people make the point that the earlier players, even bebop players, they didn't really think about the alter scale. I have made videos where I talk about different dominant scales and how you can create all these extensions without the alter scale. For example, one where I play different scales over Caravan. But that lick I'm also going to steal for later, where we're going to play this etude I made over what is this thing called love. The next chapter is the Mixolydian flat 2, flat 6 scale. That's how I was taught the name of it. Some people call it the Phrygian uh, major, Phrygian dominant. It's the fifth mode of uh, harmonic minor. But I like the name Mixolydian flat, flat 2, flat 6 because it's a Mixolydian scale with a flat two and flat six. It's a little bit easier to hear, a little bit easier to sing because it's such a recognizable sound, the harmonic minor. As opposed to, that's the altar. And this is the mix, so flat two, flat six. So it has a regular fifth in it, which makes it a little more, gives it a little bit stability. So we maybe don't have to spend as much time trying to sing it and hear it as with the alter scale takes more. You have to devote some time to that scale before it becomes part of your system, right? This is probably already part of our system. The trick with this one is to sound like jazz, so it doesn't sound like this. So 
some kind of cliche Arabic sound, but which is nice, of course, but we want to sound like... So you add some chromatics to make it sound like bebop. He goes over the same drill as before with the thirds, fourths. stuff so I want to look at some licks so now let's say we have a 251 in C minor instead you can play this scale over the whole thing so it's C harmonic minor from the book. I change it a little bit. note there which makes it interesting if you play everything by the book it's not going to be interesting you need to change something to to make it interesting so that note is a little bit funny but that's why it's a good lick and then here you could think of that G triad works over C minor right but it, you could think of it as he's extending the resolution or delaying the resolution, depending on how you think. So that lick we're also gonna use over the etude later on. Then the same drill, play the scale as triads. try to avoid talking about negative things I only cover books that I like and I do like this book a lot and I try to focus on positive things but there's something here that I want to complain about and it's the notation the notation I've seen other books by this publishing company fundamental changes they have a lot of books and it's very good the, the content is great that's not the point but the notation is super bad. Uh, the way the groupings, the rhythmic grouping is wrong. So it's very hard to read. And also, and harmonically, it's incorrect. Like it's ex examples in C minor and they use D sharp, which makes it hard to read. And so I wouldn't even pass first year theory in college. You would actually not pass if you write music like that. So whoever is writing at the actual notation they should hire somebody who knows how to do that because they clearly don't know how to do that and it's a little bit that's fine like you don't have to know how to do that but if you're selling a book uh, to people it should be correct and i don't have that problem with sheer music for example or advanced music that publishing company notation is amazing impeccable but here yeah so also, don't use like six ledger lines. That's ridiculous. Read that. No guitar player can read that. So many licks. And there's more long examples. The next scale is the symmetrical, the symmetrical diminished scale. This scale also have different names, right? It's the half whole. Some people call it the alter diminished, but I, that's just confusing. So here again, this is a scale we need to spend extra time with to just to learn how to hear it. This scale though is very different. It's not a diatonic scale, right? Now we're getting into a symmetrical scale. So it's not derived from a 
diatonic scale, it's a symmetrical. It's the way I, I look at this scale completely different. And I have made videos about this scale before. I like to think of it as like two diminished chords. So I think of it like the A flat or G sharp diminished chord. So if I have a G7, I think of a, a G sharp diminished chord or A flat, and then there's a note between. So the G, the root, is actually a passing note. Chord tone, passing, chord tone, passing, chord tone. That's makes it easier to hear it in my head. So if I start here, then I can sing it and hear it. Of course you can create all these great patterns, but this is not what this video is about. This is about this book, so let's listen to some licks. This is very much part of Mike Stern's sound, right? Like it's uh, that modern thing. So that's an E triad. You can find all these triads in the scale, right? So we're gonna take that lick as well to the etude. Then he goes through the process of playing all the intervals. Again, I wouldn't necessarily think of the scale in the same way, but anyway, let's do it. So this one works over a 13 flat 9 chord, whereas the alter scales works over a sharp 5 or flat, it's actually a flat 13, right? Flat 9. So when you see the regular 13, then it's the symmetrical diminished. If it's this chord, it's altered or the Phrygian dominant. You can actually play a chord with all the notes from the alter scale. If I play a root like that with a sustain pedal. People ask me what sustain pedal I use. I use the Super Ego. If I play like this. That's all the notes from the alter scale. So there's tons of diminished licks and tons of arpeggios and ideas. I'm kind of just skimming through here and I'm just scratching the surface. As always, whole tone scale is the next one. So it could be a sharp five chord or a flat five, but it has the regular ninth. That's what separates it. So when you see a sharp five, nine chord, then it's the whole tone scale. There could be other scales too, but to me, this suggests whole tone. I have also made a video about whole tone scale in the past. You can also, as I've shown you before, you can create a whole tone chord with all the notes from the scale. So G, A, B, C sharp, D sharp, He talks about this scale in a little different context. So imagine that you have like a C minor to G7. Or 
even like that. Many tunes have this kind of vamp, right? So let's create a vamp. It could be softly as in the morning sunrise. So here, you could think C minor, G whole tone, over the G, so what happens is that you can kind of play whole tone over the whole thing and think that it's all in C minor, so in some weird way, G whole tone works over C minor. But sometimes you want to kind of define the C too, but you can play, a lot of people do that. They play whole tone over this whole thing. If it's maybe start more inside. Listen to some examples. I like that. Let's listen to another one. Again, the notation here is bothering me, so I'm having a hard time reading it, even though it's actually that not that hard. But when you see a D sharp and a D in the key signatures are C minor, it's very confusing. Then there are some really crazy whole tone examples with like large arpeggios. <laughs> So I'm, when I have a book like this, I put down, I mark down the ones that I like. Here I've said, I've written down that it's very good. So let's see, because you're going to forget there's so much in here. So that was a very brief overview of all, all the stuff that is in the book, just scratching the surface. Again, there's 140 live audio examples, one of which is a long blues solo that I played a little bit of in the beginning there. Now I shall play you the etude I made. Thank you again for your time and attention, and I shall see you next time.